Jim Riley, welcome to the podcast, brother. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, I am too. I've been looking forward to it. I saw it on my calendar. I'm like, hey, I've got something to do today. <laughs> Let's go. I love it. And so we're going to dive right into this. I'd love if you could give the audience just an idea of what was life like for little Jim, kind of as you grew up, what was your background like? Um, fill us in. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of people don't ask me about little Jim, but when I was young, uh, I remember as far back as junior high being an entrepreneur. Uh, I'd walk to school with my two dollars that my mom gave me for lunch money, and I'd, and I'd stop at the store and buy gum. By the time I got to school and, and got to lunch, I'd tripled or quadrupled that money. I'd sell nice. gum for twenty-five cents a piece. <laughs> um, little Jim was always an entrepreneur. I grew up uh, with my mother until I was uh, twelve, and then I moved in with my dad, who had remarried. And I had two stepbrothers and that was the primary reason for moving in with my dad is to have some brothers and, yeah. and, uh, you know, just kind of enjoy the camaraderie and they really helped build, bring me out of my shell. We played sports together. We played sports in school. I wrestled for eight years, uh, junior high, high school, a little bit in college. I played football, uh, through high right. school and, uh, I worked a lot. I really enjoyed working and getting my hands dirty so in the summers and every long break that we had with school at the age of 13, I worked for my grandfather in the city of Newport Beach, California, uh, yeah. who wouldn't want to work at the beach as a kid. We had a restaurant yeah. liter literally right on the sand on 15th Street called the Stuff Surfer. And then we had another one on what they call Balboa Island. And that was called the Quickie Sandwiches and Hamburgers. So uh, cool. as a kid, 13, I was uh, making hamburgers and sandwiches and collecting money and, and learning about business at a very young age. Love it. And, and were these your grandparents, uh, or your grandpa, like he, he built these, this was like his, his business. Yeah, they were his businesses. Well, oddly enough, he was a meat man most of his life. He was a world war II veteran and, uh, was, was always working with his hands. So the quickie sandwiches and hamburgers is something he built from scratch. Uh, as a meat man, he learned how to make great sandwiches and how to, you know, good cuts of meat and things like that. So he was very popular on Balboa Island with his sandwiches and hamburgers. Whereas the other restaurant, the Stuff Surfer on the beach, that had existed. It was kind of an iconic place where people would get nachos and stuff. And, huh. and then he turned that into another version of sandwiches and hamburgers. So, uh, but, that. you know, he taught me all about business. The great thing is he paid me in cash. We're talking about <laughs> the 80s. Nice. So when I was yeah. a kid in, in the 80s, you know, I was getting five bucks an hour cash it was pretty darn good money at the crushing time. Crushing it, yeah. Yeah, crushing it. So cool. Okay. And so then you're working for grandpa, you're doing this in the summers breaks, basically like anytime you can, you're getting around him and kind of getting that entrepreneur spirit just more ingrained into you. Yeah. And one thing that I'm curious when this comes into your story, because I know when I was on your podcast, we talked about this a little bit, but at some point throughout your education journey, you decided to stop going to school. Um, and I'm curious if you could kind of fill us in, you know, when did that come? What was that like? Um, and if you could just kind of fill us in from there. Yeah. And, and I realized that we've got a great audience that in their twenties and, and people sure. are trying to figure it out at that age. Um, I do have to take a step back before I can answer that question. So Please. that there's some context behind it, but I worked for my grandfather until I was 16. And then at that point I could actually legally work for an employer. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, uh, because we were traveling, uh, to get to my grandfather's, it was an hour away from where I lived with my parents. Um, I wound up getting a job at a place called In-N-Out Burger. And if you're a California guy, uh, our gal, of you know, everybody knows In-N-Out. Of course, it's worked its way east to Texas now and north is Utah and Oregon. But uh, yeah. I worked there. That was my first job. And uh, at 16, I came on board with In-N-Out. And back in the day, it was really hard work. I'm not saying it's not hard now, but man, we really grinded it out during our shifts and we worked hard. And, and they loved me because... Here I was this fresh 16 year old, but I had all this business experience. You know, my right. grandfather was one of those guys like, you got time to lean, you got time to clean, you, <laughs> have, you know, always have busy hands and don't waste time. And he taught me how to, um, you know, talk to customers and be outgoing. You know, all right. the years living with my mom, I was pretty shy. I moved in with my brothers. All of a sudden I've got a crew and then I start working for my grandfather. It just, I came out of my shell. Yeah. I think it's important to understand that in your formative years, you know, if you're in your teens um, or, or you're in high school and you're thinking about getting a job or you're in your early 20s and you haven't really taken on a job, the great thing about customer service businesses is it gets you used to talking to people and interacting mm -hmm. and it really forces you to get out of the shell. So 
to get to your answer that you're looking for yeah. about school, um, I went all the way through high school working for in and out at the age of 18 because of the success I had there. They put me into their management program at in and out Burger. A lot of people aren't familiar with their management training program. It's a lot like what they do over at Disney. They have a formal university of in and out like Disney has a university of Disney and you go there and you oh. learn management skills, uh, you know, accounting principles. And, and these days it's, it's a history lesson about in and out and it's about, right. you know, all these different management things so that you cool. learn in their school, which was phenomenal. And at the time in and out had donated a, a fair amount of money to Cal Poly Pomona, which is the, the university there in the local right. area from their corporate office. And as a gratitude gesture from the college, they gave in and out for their managers an opportunity to get a, a free college education. So That's I actually true. went into a program at Cal Poly through my in and out career and mm -hmm. uh, started going, going to college there. Now it wasn't a requirement to do that. If you worked at in and out, it was, a, it was a benefit, right? Right. But I was making so much money at in and out and I was so focused on my career there that I wound up dropping out of college and uh, to me, it was, a, it was a, a better decision based on my personality, where I fit and what I was looking to do. Granted, at the time, at 18 years old, I was making 45 grand a year in 1987, 88. Yeah, crushing. It's a lot of, it's a lot oh, yeah. of money, right? Yeah. Um, when I was 26, when I finally left in and out, I was making 150 grand a year as a store manager. Again, a lot of money, and that's in the mid '90s. So uh, it, that gave me the confidence to not continue with my college education, and uh, I, I really dependent on it to like build your identity, essentially. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And I think I really had a clear focus of who I was and what I wanted out of life, and I and it wasn't what I was going to extract from a college education. As important as that is to many, it's not right. for everyone. Yeah. And I think one thing that's really interesting to kind of go back into what you're saying is like you went through this process and it was through your brothers of kind of coming out of your shell. Um, and I grew up in a similar place. I, I had a sibling, I had an older brother, but I grew up in a very similar aspect where I had an older brother. He was the shy, extroverted, outgoing one. And I was like the shy, quiet, introverted one. And once I learned to come out of that shell, I began to realize how life is so much more beautiful when you can just openly have conversations, whether mm -hmm. it's for your career, whether it's for your life, whether it's for relationships, like being good with people will just increase your happiness in life. And I think one really interesting thing that you pointed out is it's like, if you, most of the time, if you're introverted, part of you doesn't want to change because it's comfortable. Yeah, and I think, yeah. and I think one thing that's interesting you said is like, if you can put yourself in customer service or you can put yourself in a profession where you're going to have to learn how to get good with people. That's almost going to force you to come out of your shell. And that's really going to open up a lot of doors for your career, for your happiness, for just so many different things in your life that, that will unfold just because you got good with people. So I, I just think that was really cool. Yeah. And I appreciate you bringing that up again, because, you know, oftentimes I get advice, I get asked for advice from parents, you know, they've got kids that are getting ready to be of working age or career choices and I always tell them, I said, try to get them in customer service, whether that's for six months or a year. If they can do it while they're in high school, it's even better because they're the flexibility of, of like quick service, fast food type places. But it really, it puts them in that situation where they've got to learn how to interact with people. And right. we're so terrible these days about having our faces in our phones. I, you know, it just drives me nuts when I'm at a, a busy stoplight, you know, where there's a lot of pedestrians and you look around and you see everybody crossing the streets with their faces and their phones. Yeah. You know, one, one thing, look, I understand that customer service isn't for everybody and maybe that's not what yeah. you go and do, but it is important to learn how to interact with people. And one of the things that I've coached a few people on, you know, you're in line at the Starbucks, instead of ha having your phone in your face, put your phone in your pocket or in your purse and make it a point just to say hi to the, first, the person in front of you or behind you. No more, no less. You know, yeah. it could turn into a conversation. It can turn into a laugh. It could turn into a smile. It can turn into education, anything. But by creating those little teeny habits, you'll start to come out of your shell and yeah. learn the skill of interacting with people. Yeah, I love it. And, and for anyone that wants to try this, one tip I would give you on top of that is complimenting people. 
it's, mm-hmm. it's one yeah. of the simplest ways to start a conversation where you're in Starbucks, you're waiting for your coffee or whatever you're getting. And you just look at the person next to you and figure out something you like about them and just go, Hey, I love your shirt. Where'd you get it? Right. And, yeah. and just allow to see where that conversation goes. And it may just be, it ends there or it may lead to a beautiful conversation. But um, I think we're on that same page where it's like, you, you got to find some way to start to get out of that shell. And so now let's say we jump forward. You're at in and out for 12 years, crushing it again. Um, and I'm curious at what point did you decide to leave that? Cause I mean, you're at this point, 26, you're making 150 grand. Um, nowadays, 150 grand is, I mean, I don't know what 300, 400 grand or something like that. So like, yeah. I mean, you're doing really, really well. And I'm curious at what, like what at that point, made you say, I'm leaving, I'm going, I'm doing something different. I want to change because for, I think for most people at that point, they go, okay, I've made it. Like, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to keep making the good money, probably get free hamburgers and life's good. <laughs> and, and trust me, life, life was spectacular. It, yeah. it really was. Matter of fact, now I heard the latest st- statistics at in and out average store manager makes between 250 and $300,000 a year. So wow. looking for a career choice, you know, and you're on the West coast, there you go. Um, in and out. <laughs> you know, what I love about the title of your show and, you know, when you spoke to me in the beginning about, you know, what was, where'd you find direction in life? You know, I've, I've always stumbled into things. Uh, you know, working for my grandfather was a family thing, but I stumbled into it. I detailed cars in high school, you know, on yeah. top of everything else. And I stumbled into these opportunities, but there comes a point when you have to do things with intent. And I think that that intent comes from understanding who you are. And I talk a lot about it and that's your values. And sometimes your values can hit you right in the face and you never even realize it until you're put in a set of circumstances where you can't ignore it anymore. And, and this is the beautiful part about my story. And I, I love that I'm talking to a younger audience because this happened to me in my mid twenties. Uh, I was married already. I'm living large, man. I got the Beamer, I've got the house. Yeah. I'm living in Orange County by the beach, working for not making all the money. And uh, matter of fact, uh, speaking about Mammoth, California, uh, my yeah. wife and, and I, we decided we're gonna go up to Mammoth with some of our church friends and spend the weekend up in Mammoth. And uh, we didn't have any gear or anything. It's like, oh, let's go buy new snowboards and outfits. Yeah. And we're staying in this awesome condo. And we went up there with these people and we're you know, throwing money around, having you know, food and drinks and ski and all that stuff for the weekend. We get home, wasn't even a big deal, but we spent about five grand between the gear and going. And you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that stuff's expensive, right? For sure. Um, we go about our normal week as we would any other time. And we had committed the following weekend to go on a overnight, actually, it was just a, a really long day mission trip with our local church uh, uh, in Newport Beach, California. So, yeah, we're going to go down, and I think we're all exposed to something like this one time or another, but it's we're going to cross the border in Takati with two vans of people with a bunch of food and supplies. And we're going to hit the orphanages in Takati and head down to Ensenada and then back around up to TJ and, you know, go back home. Yeah. Like literally, I think we met at 4 a.m. in the church parking lot and got back at midnight or something like that. Um, but here's the crazy part. And here's the turning point Yeah, is the budget for two vans of people, six orphanages and countless kids was $5,000. And spending the day and watching how far that money would go and how long this orphanage would utilize the resources we brought to them. Some of the supplies would last a month or two based on what it was, you know, a 50 pound sack of flour is going to last a month or, you know what I mean? And my wife and I got back home and we're like, wow, we blew five grand last week in Mammoth and the budget for all these kids and all these orphanages that we just saw today is five grand for a couple months. We were absolutely living selfishly and for the wrong reasons. And it, you can identify those things in your life, but doing something about it is a completely different story. And we spent the next couple months really digging in on who we are and what, is, what are our personal values. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't about the money and the glamour and the beamers, because really, I mean, how many uber wealthy people do you know that are, that are happy? 
You know, there, there's yeah. all kinds of issues associated with, with money and, and, you know, materialistic items. And what we decided to do, this is the bold move that I encourage people to think about, you know, whatever's bold for you yeah. is we left our, now Grant, my wife was making pretty good money too. So we had a, we had a nice income in the house. We both left our jobs in Southern California, you know, so over 200 grand a year in the yeah. mid 90s. And we said, let's just move to Lake Tahoe, a small, sleepy ski town. Let's work for minimum wage. Let's recenter and figure out who we are as people. And let's get to know okay. people. Let's, let's, let's introduce ourselves, right? So we yeah. literally, I quit my job. Uh, you know, backstory, my brother is VP of In-N-Out Burger at the time. You know, he's way up there. He's got yeah. aspirations for me. He was so mad that I quit. Dang. And, and my family, they're like, how could you do this? Yeah. And, and to try to explain to my friends and family that, hey, money's not important to me. I'm not happy. I've realized, I've looked inside my soul who I am, and I'm changing direction of who I am and what I, what I want to be known for, right? Because of this experience I had in one day within these orphanages yeah. in Mexico and uh, really aligned myself with my values. So we moved to Lake Tahoe. Um, I literally... <laughs> I took a job at Kirkwood Ski Resort as a photographer. You know, when you're skiing, you get to the top, like, hey, let me get your picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was commission only, <laughs> and I got a ski pass. I didn't make any money for the first month. And then I finally landed a job at the casino, at Harvey's Casino on the South Shore Lake Tahoe, as the buffet supervisor making, I think, $8 an hour, something like that, you know? But I was happy. I was happy. My wife was happy. Uh, we were meeting people. We weren't chasing the next expensive item. You know, we got right. rid of the Beamer and got a pickup truck, you know. Yeah. And uh, we lived our lives and discovered that there was more to life than just making money. And, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, and I'll continue a little bit more of the story. When yeah. you start living for genuine values, people see that, right? And you become more attractive to them. And, right. and people want to be associated with you because of your happiness and how content you are with the decisions that you're making and what you're doing. I wound up landing an incredible job at Sierra Toski Resort uh, oh. that ultimately um, made me the food and beverage director for nine restaurants at one of the most popular ski resorts in California. And I was there for four years in that job that launched a whole bunch of my other career choices beyond right. that. But it was because of uh, my, I don't want to say inner peace. That seems a little bit overly spiritual, but people could tell us happy, willing, it's happy to go to work and do whatever. And um, they saw that. It's attractive when you're able to, to find that within yourself and present that to others. Yeah. And, and I think it's really interesting as you kind of look at, and we'll obviously dive further into the trajectory that you went in your life and how incredible you've done. But it's interesting that like, let's say you look at those two pivots in your life where it's like in and out, there's one route where your brother's VP at the time, you could have kept going that way and got high up in the company, made a bunch of money and you still would have done really well financially, but maybe happiness wouldn't have been there. But because you pivoted and you said, what is my soul calling for? What does my soul want more of? And you followed that. It still has led you to this incredible life that you lived and financially you've done just fine. But happiness has been such a bigger thing in that point. And so I think it's just kind of really cool to look at, you know, like you can, I can almost see it visually, these two different paths that you've taken. And one thing, again, if we jump back into that story for just a moment that I think um, is a theme I've seen in my life as well is, mm -hmm. and I obviously work with Tony Robbins. And one of the things he teaches is the secret to living is giving. And, you know, it's like sometimes we get caught up in I got to chase this next dollar. I got to make more money here. I got to get the nicer car. And I just think one thing that from your story, we could encourage all of our listeners to do is find some way, maybe just in the next week or two that you can just give back. And whether yeah. that's, you know, you see a homeless person on the side of the road and you give them some food or some money, whether it's um, there's uh, a place you can go volunteer on the weekend, or there's a soup, uh, soup kitchen that you can go volunteer and, you know, help with that, like find some way that you can just go just give back for the pure reason of just giving and not wanting anything. Mm -hmm. And I think both of us could agree from our experiences in life that, your life will massively change because of that one little thing that you do. Absolutely. And I will tell you, I have not stopped working with those orphanages since that trip yeah. all those years ago. I'm 53 now. 
I still work with those orphanages and we still give, right? Yeah. Um, and there's so many ways that you can give. And I think it's a very important topic. You could do shows and shows on this, but as you give, 10 times will come back to you. Yep. And you may not see it right away, but it will come back to you. And it may not be monetary, but it could just be in happiness. Yeah. It could be in the form of being able to help somebody else through you helping. Uh, you, if you're open to it, you'll see it. And, and by the way, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, um, right. I tell you, this happened last week and I'm not looking for the glory of this story, but how simple it can be. Right. I'm, I'm walking into the grocery store with my seven-year-old daughter. It's 830 at night, mountain town, so there's not a lot of people out. Yeah. And as we're walking through the front of the store, we're crossing at the end of the registers and there's a, there's a man, he's a little disheveled. I don't think he was homeless, but he's got his bag and the lady's telling him how much. And he's like, well, I guess we're not going to be able to get that tonight. Uh, I'm going to have to come back. Right. And I overhear it. And I just, I stop in my tracks and he's starting to walk away. And I'm like, sir, sir, I got you. And he looks at me and, and the lady at the register, she's like, yeah, I happen to see what it was. It wasn't a ton of money. It was a few bucks. I just whipped out some money. I said, here, cover this for him. And he stand, the guy's standing there like, what do I do? I said, hey, go enjoy your night. I got yeah. this. Don't worry about it, right? So he walks out and everybody in line's looking at me and my daughter, right? And as I'm doing the transaction, so I'm holding them all up now, but they're all looking yeah. at me with, with eyes of affirmation and gratitude and like, wow, that dude just stopped. And, you know, so she gave me the change and we continued on into the store. And my daughter says, gosh, daddy, that was so nice that you did that. Yeah. I said, look, it's not a big deal. And I was happy to do it. We can afford it. We've been blessed. I said, but more importantly, and I guess this is the message, right? It's easy to hear that and keep walking. And we might've made it all the way to the milk aisle. And in our minds, and we could be nice, compassionate people in our minds, we might go, man, I should have paid for that. It wouldn't have been a big deal, but we yeah. didn't. Right. Yeah. So we actually have to consciously think about our ability and willingness to give back when the time arises and strike at that moment. Yeah. And that was a more important lesson for my daughter because I would have hate to got to the milk aisle because I know I would have done like, darn it, I should have paid for that <laughs> yeah, guy's yeah. stuff, right? And uh, anyway, so that the moral of the story is you can give even small little op opportunities, right? That was less than five bucks, but it changed my wife, my daughter's opinion, yeah. everybody in line's opinion. And who knows what this guy was going through um, where he was really wanting that item it, by the way, it was graham crackers. It wasn't like it was alcohol or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it was a comfort food. So yeah. um, anyways, it, it just pays tenfold to give back. And you might not see the results, but I know my daughter saw it happen. Yeah. Right? And, and, and that's, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say too, that the, the joy you got from it, the joy your daughter got it from it, the joy, the cash register, this man, everyone in line, that alone, the value of that is worth 10 times more than $5 just you know, that joy that you brought to everybody's life. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we started to talk about giving back and the value of it. And, and that's, that's where my life changed direction in learning yeah. to give back and the value of it and, and forcing me to look at my own values and what's important to me. Right. I love it. And so now you're at Sierra, you're running the nine restaurants, you're kind of a full circle moment where you're like, wow, I've, you know, followed my heart, changed my direction. I've lead with giving. I'm running yep. all these restaurants and, and doing great. And I'm curious at what point did it go from that to then, I believe Kettle One was sort of where you went next. Yeah, um, yeah. Because that's you know, kind of two different places. That's completely two different places. <laughs> uh, life isn't all roses all the time. And, and by the way, I was living a great life at the ski resort. It was, a, it was probably one of the top jobs you can have in a ski town is a you know, senior position at a ski resort made really good money, by the way, because we talked about numbers and I'm not shy just to be honest with people. I was making 60 grand at the ski resort. I was on top of the world. <laughs> I might as well have been making a half a million dollars. Yeah. I was living my dream life, my dream job, doing what I wanted to do. I was happy about it. And I was still giving back to the orphanages, you know, writing checks and stuff like that, helping people. Uh, I had a great team of people. Uh, my ex-wife now, she didn't want to live in Tahoe anymore. It's, it's kind of like living on an island, you know, you just... yeah she liked the fancy stuff and the stores and the shows and the, you know, the plays and all that stuff. And um, she wanted to come back to Southern California and she said, I'm going with or without you. <laughs> so uh, I packed my stuff up. 
Uh, one, one of the things are one of the parts of my job when I was at the ski resort is, uh, at one point during my career, the marketing person came to me on a, on a Friday afternoon. He said, Hey, we bought two years worth of airtime on the local television station. And tomorrow I can't be there. Can you do it for me? I'm like, what am I supposed to do on TV for you? Yeah. <laughs> because I don't know, do the ski report. Uh, I'll give it to you in the morning and do this and, you know, maybe bring some food. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I can do that, right? So I brought all this food and, and I went on the air and I was on air for about 20 minutes. And when I was off the air, and by the way, the, the television channel went from Reno to Tahoe. So it had almost a million viewers. Um, so it was a, a pretty decent size show at yeah. 8 to 8.20 on Saturday mornings. And uh, when I was done, they're like, hey, can you come back next weekend? And I'm like, I don't know. I just was filling. And he goes, well, we love the food. Well, it turned into two years of doing a TV show every Saturday for 20 minutes, bringing food and talking about all kinds of different things. And uh, the reason why I bring that story up, not only is it kind of an eclectic part of my job, (laughs) but uh, when I moved back down to Southern California, um, let me just say when I was um, 18 working for it, they had a lot of public speakers there. They never had Tony Robbins. He was (laughs) around then. Uh, yeah, yeah. they had a, a guy by the name of Mark Victor Hansen who wrote chicken soup for the soul. Yeah. And, uh, with, uh, he had a co-author. Um, but anyways, he said, what you believe is what you will achieve. And at 18, I wrote that down. I actually got it on a cassette tape, which is on my desk behind me over there. I still carry that cassette tape because that phrase meant so much to me. What oh. you believe is what you will achieve by Mark Victor Hansen. So uh, back to my story of working for the TV and moving back down to Southern California, I was, uh, was actually surfing and my uh, wife had called me. She said, hey, we're doing a fundraiser tonight for my new job uh, for the Pacific Symphony um, here at the property. It's a black tie gala. Cartier is sponsoring it. Yeah. I need you to go get a tux. I'm literally in my wetsuit at Huntington Beach going, really? <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'll, I'll be there. So um, I rented the tux, I showed up to the event, and I happened to be seated with the owner of Kettle One Vodka and the president of Kettle One Vodka and their wives at a black tie affair. We're all drinking green apple martinis made out of Kettle One. And I was having good conversation with everybody because, you know, I learned how to talk to people when I was at yeah. In-N-Out. And yeah. uh, the president looks over at me and goes, Jim, I really like your style. I said, Bill, we're all in black tuxedos drinking your drink. Of course you like my style. <laughs> <laughs> you are doing the same thing, right? Yeah. And, uh, and he says, and this is why I told you the story about the TV show. He says, Jim, we're, we're just launching this brand Kettle One. We think it's important to be amongst influencers in Hollywood and, and movies and all that stuff. You seem like the right guy with your TV background to get us up there. And I looked at him and I said, you understand I was on PAX tele- cable television, Tahoe, right? He goes, no, no, we, we get it. We just think you're the right guy. He says, why don't you come in on Monday and uh, we'll, we'll interview. So I came in on Monday and I interviewed and he offered me the job on the spot. Huh. And uh, it was because I believed in myself. And, yeah. you, you know, he asked some tough questions. And, and this is actually one for your, your listeners as well. If you remember in the story, I didn't graduate college. Right. And one of the requirements for having a career there was to have a college education. Hmm. And uh, I'd learned something a long time ago. And, and basically it was about, you know, being consistent and being committed. And I was really committed to in out. I spent 12 years and I said, Bill, you know, what, what would I give from college to this job that I, I couldn't give as, as I am today? He says, well, you know, college shows commitment. I said, I worked for in out Burger for 12 years. Yeah. It was one of the most successful managers there, there of all time. Right. He goes, well, I guess that shows commitment. I said, the point is, is, Anything that that college education is going to give me, I can give you through my life experience. And we walk through the steps, right? And I think that that's a good learning lesson for people that are listening and trying to decide where they're going to go in life. If you're pursuing a career that makes you happy and you don't need to go to college and you have the requirements to do that job, have the confidence to know that you probably could land that job, right? So um, that's how I got the job at Kettle One. And I was their vice president of public relations, events, and marketing uh, for almost 10 years until we sold the company. Uh, it was a, basically, it was publicly talked about being a $2 billion deal. I think they took right. half. I don't, they didn't take the other half, but um, right. it, was, it was a great career, a great brand. And here's the real cool part about it. In my role as an event VP, along with the other titles I held, 
we gave back over $2 million a year to charity organizations through my department. I love that. So I was really able to extend my giving to all these great organizations around the country. Yeah. Uh, and I was involved with so many spectacular uh, fundraising efforts, all different types. Yeah. So, 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 so cool. Um, one thing that I'm curious, because everything that I've studied from you and in our conversations on your podcast and here is you have this ability to get into something and work your way to the top and move to something else and work your way to the top and move yourself to something else and work and all different, right? We go from in and out to ski resorts, to mm -hmm. vodka, um, all these different things. I'm curious, like, what do you believe is something that when you're going and starting something new that you are always applying, that's giving you that ability to, I wouldn't say quickly, right? Cause 12 years, one place, 10 years, another place. But what do you think is that thing that helps you really rise to the top? Because you've done it over and over and over and over. Here's the greatest part about that. And, and thank you for asking that and identifying that. And by the way, I, I started two companies after I left Kettle One and, and we had a lot of success. Uh, we'll probably run out of time to talk about it all. But yeah. here's the greatest part about your question. Everybody possesses the same skills that I do and can do exactly what I did. And I learned those skills working for my grandfather, right? We talked about, yeah. you know, busy hands. If there's time to lean, there's time to clean, right? So when you look at your own career choices or what you're doing in life, maximize your time, put it to good use, have a focus, right? If you know what the, the job objective is, be the best you can be in that career, right? If, if you work, I, I coach a gentleman, uh, I won't give his name, but he, he was a meth addict. He came out of rehab. We got him a job at the local garbage company, right? And if you yeah. get a job at the garbage company, you're sorting trash, entry level, eight bucks an hour, whatever the minimum wage is in California. Yeah. Within two months of he and I working together, and I'm not going to take the credit for it, but we just talked about working hard, being the best person you can. Your past doesn't define you, right? Do everything you can to help that employer achieve that job. In two months, he got a raise. In six months, he got another, another raise. In under a year, he put himself in his own apartment, living by himself, came from a rehab facility in under a year, own apartment, and bought a car, right? We all possess the skills to work hard and have a genuine desire to succeed, right? Like I said, what you believe is what you will achieve. Yeah. If you believe in yourself and you put those thoughts in your mind and you give it your effort, right, you'll yeah. succeed. It's also important to follow. I talked about values. Follow what you love. You know, the cliche of, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. It's true. When I left yeah. in and out okay, in and out paid me really well, but it wasn't very creative. If you know the place, it's hamburgers, fries, and drinks. That's <laughs> yeah. it. Okay. I'm a creative person. You know, I got a podcast. I race cars. I got, you know, I got a dozen things going on in my life right now. That yeah. wasn't going to do it for me. Right. So find what you love and focus on doing that for a career or for work or for education and build yourself around those things because you'll be happy doing it and you'll be able to succeed in it. And that is why I've been able to rise to the top in everything I've done because I realized after leaving in and out and all that money at the time, anything I do in the future, I'm going to do it for the right reasons. And that's yeah. going to allow me to succeed because people are going to see that. Right. And it's going to be infectious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's huge, right? It's like, as you go into anything you do, are you going to be the person, there's two different types of people, the person that just gets the job done and is there and they get the check and they move on. And then there's the person that takes the extra mile of it. Maybe they go home and they research a little bit more. And if you look at those two people, one of the differentiating factors that you're talking about is, the person that's going to go the extra mile, they, they like what they do. Yeah. Right? If, I mean, if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to go home and go, Oh, let me, let me learn a little bit more about this. Or when I'm at work, let me do that extra thing. That's a little inconvenient, but it's going to help the company. If you're not really excited to be there, you're not going to do that. But if you love it and you're excited about it, then you're going to do more. And again, that helps you rise quicker. So um, I love those couple tips that you have there on, on how you can really rise. And um Obviously, like you said, there's a massive amount of your story. We could literally be here for two hours. But <laughs> one, one or two last couple of things I want to pick apart is you have this infectious, um, I don't know what you would call it, this infectious pattern or habit mm -hmm. of saying yes, mm -hmm. right? And something yeah. approaches you, you go yes. Something approaches you, you go yes, right? Obviously, the podcast you have is called The Answer is Yes. So like you're a big yes man. <laughs> 
And I'm curious for you, what do you think is the importance in just continuously saying yes, as we do move throughout our life? Well, it's a tough question because I, I'm a firm believer in saying yes to opportunities in life, right? And yeah. it, it doesn't mean I don't say no to things, but I've a, I, I know what I want to say no to, right? right? Because it doesn't align with my values. So I'm always happy to say yes when it does align with my values. Where that came from for me, though, saying yes yeah, is yeah. Uh, as being an entrepreneur, right? Uh, when, when Bill at Kettle One says, Jim, we want you to help us get into Hollywood. Yes, Bill, I will do that. <laughs> I'll figure it out later on my own time, right? Out, yeah. you know, I had to go back home and go, crap, how do I don't know any celebrities? How am I gonna meet some celebrities? Right. And yeah. and you figure it out, right? Because you know what the goal is, you know what the target is, and that's what I went after, right? So I said yes and knew that I would be able to figure it out. Right. right. So and it's important, by the way. I got a list of all the celebrities I've met in a book. And I think I've met every single one, you know, in the era, like everybody you could ever imagine. Yeah. I love it too, where it's like, what are your values and knowing that? And then if there's opportunities that are in alignment with that, it's saying yes and figuring it out. Not saying yes to everything, but everything that aligns with your values, whether it scares you or pushes you to grow, you're saying yes. Yeah. Well, and, and that's why I say sometimes you have to say no. If you talk to my brother at in and out right, they've been around since 1948. They have the same menu that they did back then. Maybe they, they added Dr. Pepper, right? Like big deal. Yeah. Um, he said the hardest part of his job is saying no, because it's easy to say yes to expanse and all these other things, but saying no. So there is a time and a place to say yes, as well as to say no, but aligning your yeses with who you are, and having the confidence makes those choices so much easier and it opens up so many doors yeah. for you, right? And by the way, that yes could come at Starbucks in line, right? Yeah, it could for <laughs> real with that random stranger, you never know. Um, so Jim, as we wrap up here, I'm curious, you know, you've had such a cool story, such a cool life and, and I appreciate you for being here and really just being an open book. Um, I'm curious if people want to find more information about you, see what you're up to, check out what you're doing. Um, where's the best place that they can go? Yeah, my website is Live Life Driven. A little bit of play on my off-road racing. So livelifedriven.com. My phone number's on there. My email's on there. Nice. My podcast is on there. The answer is yes. And I do a, a bi-monthly blog on there. And, you know, I would just encourage people, if, if really they're soul searching or had a question, send me an email. I, I love getting emails. I love getting feedback on shows. And I love helping people. And I know that through that, if I'm able to help somebody, it, it comes back to me tenfold. And that's another great lesson yeah. for people to understand is by helping others, it comes back. And, and it's just such a joy for me to be doing all that. You know, I get the most excitement out of my podcasts. And because of this is the topic of conversation, I interview people on the podcast that have said yes to things throughout their lives and, and learned the direction of their careers. And I think there's a lot of lessons to those people's lives, if you're willing to listen to a few shows. And it's all different topics from athletes yeah. to military to executives, et cetera. So have some yeah. fun with it. Explore outside of your, your boundaries and, and start saying yes to some things. I love it. So um, two last questions. Usually I ask just one last question, but because you have such, like you brought it up there, you're like, oh, and just to touch on the off-road racing, I, yeah. I have this last one question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just curious, what would you say are three fun facts about yourself that our listeners have would hear and be like, wait, what? Well, I, I raced off-road professionally for 12 years. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's, it's not the guy in the mud bog. Uh, we raced from Ensenada to Baja in the Baja 1000. I've won it uh, three different times and three different classes. So that's a big, really? You did that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so, so kind of interesting uh here's another aha uh -huh. i don't know if i told you i'm sorry they're all extreme sport related because that's yeah that's what keeps me at this level that i'm at uh in 29 2018 at the end of 2018 i lost the whole year because of covid right at the end of 2018 i was third in the world for men over 50 in the spartan racing championships i went and raced in iceland it was a 24-hour race i raced 43 miles in 24 hours and Goodness. was ranked third in the world uh, doing that, you know, so there is another big aha yeah. moment and, uh, I'm, you know, I'm living my dream in Montana, Southern California, boy, nice. beach boy. I'm living my dream in Montana. And it's funny. I do business with a guy 
the last three years, I had a Zoom call with him today. And he's like, where are you at? I said, I'm in Montana. He goes, I didn't even know you were there. So there's still an aha for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, when you know what your values are and what your dreams are, it's easy to chase after them. And I'm sure Tony Robbins would say that yeah. too. Write out those goals, work towards those goals every single day, five minutes a day, if that's all you got. Eventually, you'll find yourself in Montana with a ranch and two beautiful daughters and more animals than I can count. So uh, <laughs> it's a lot of ahas for people, but uh, it's okay and it's possible to live your dream. Yeah, I love it. So um, last question now, we ask this to every single guest. We're all about how people find direction in their life, mm -hmm. but we're a massive believer that it's through action. And so I would be curious, what would you say is one thing our listeners can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction in their life? Wow. It's a great question because they just talked about my own direction for the last 20 minutes or so. Yeah. And, and it can be, to give you some thought time, it can be, you know, finding direction in the next six months. It can be finding direction in the next year. It's not, how do you find direction for the rest of your life? But even something people can do if they're just, you know, kind of in that last place, what's something they can do in 24 hours, 48 hours to, to just start finding direction. Yeah. Th this is what I'm going to say. And, and if, if I, any of my coaching clients are listening to me. I, I start all my coaching with this, right? Huh. Write down what your true values are. Okay. Write down your true values because based on those values, you can develop your goals. And some people might look at those as the same thing. And I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to tell you what my values are. Uh, I'm going to hold up my yellow pad. This is my Love daily that. act. These are all the things I got to work on today. I transfer this every day on the top of this. I write my values down every single day. They're the same. Hmm but I write them down, right? So this is value. God, family, health, giving back, time. The last thing is business. The last mm -hmm. thing's making money, right? Know what your values are because if you know these values, when you start to uh, write up what your goals are, right? So for me, I, I mentioned going to Montana. So my family values, that's, one, that's on the top of the list, right? Yeah. Family, the importance of where I live. It's not about chasing money, living in Southern California, fast cars, right? It's about my family and Montana was, was one of those things that aligned with my values. So if you know what your values are, you can start writing out your goals and work towards achieving them and spend five minutes a day with it. Right. That, that's all you got to do. Love I got that. one more tip though. One more, Please. one more, one more little thing. You probably Thank already you. do this. You probably are already buying the philosophy. What goes along with those two things, right? Values, goals, spend every morning, the second you wake up, Write down five things you're grateful for. And if you're really good at it, you'll do five things before you go to bed because that sets the pace for your whole day, right? If you're grateful, and it could be as small as the roof over your head, the warm blanket you had, or the meal you had the night before, and it can be extravagant, right? The car in the garage. Yeah. But if you start your day with being grateful, your day will, will continue on that way if you allow it to be that way, right? Yeah. I, I know you know this. Yeah. Big, big fans of gratitude here. So yeah, yeah. Um, you're speaking the right language. Well, Jim, it has been, um, it's been a blast, man, exploring your life, digging into the crevices, figuring out what built you into who you are today and, and some of the philosophies you have. So I just want to say thank you again, man, for hopping on and, and being a guest. And I know people are going to get a ton of value. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Time well spent. Thank you so much. Absolutely.